Welcome back to the Black Tower Podcast, a Wheel of Time podcast. I am Andrew. Unfortunately, Aaron could not be with us during this recording. Uh, he's a busy, busy man. But he is with us here uh, in heart and spirit and from the world of dreams and throws some other weird stuff in there that he's watching us from, like a peephole or something. Um, and today we're going to talk about, of course, Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. We have two very special guests with us, so I'm going to let introduce themselves and then hit us up with the very nice spoiler warning. Hi, I am James Stark from Tarvalon.net. I am the director of marketing there. Um, my, we use pseudonyms there, so my pseudonym there is Jafon Kelly-Arthan, if you ever decide to stalk me there, I guess. And I'm Sahar Manavi uh, on Tarvalon.net. I go by Eluil Alderan. Uh, I am the main person that you see posting on our Twitter account. So if you liked my jokes, that's me. This podcast might contain content that could impact some more sensitive listeners, including conversations about sexuality and how it relates to the Wheel of Time. And of course, as always, this podcast may contain spoilers from the entire series. If you have not read the entire series, you're at risk of being spoiled. That was your warning for... (laughs) both series spoilers and your sensitivity content warning, I guess is <laughs> your the, the phrase we're going to go with. You have been warned <laughs> about everything now, people. You can't sue us. There's nothing you have not been warned about. Mm-hmm. Like cancer, you were warned yeah, about in that. I guess right. might cause cancer. It's rated by the Surgeon General and known to the state of California to cause cancer. <laughs> hey, serious stuff. All right. <clears throat> so... With the pending television adaptation of Wheel of Time, many of our real-life socio-political issues will be thrust into the forefront of the joint Amazon-Sony television screen. Already seen as a bastion of female empowerment, gender role politics, gender equality, and the power of joining together, the Wheel of Time provides a platform for the fantasy fandom to talk about the issues that matter to our modern social world. Whether it's the morality of war, the immorality of torture and slavery, all the way to the secrecy or publicity surrounding same-sex relationships and gender identity, we can all find examples and learning benchmarks within our favorite fantasy series. In true Black Tower fashion, we are going to attempt to avoid real-world politics in this episode as much as we can. It is somewhat unavoidable that they will make their way into the discussion in some way, shape, or form, but we want to remind our audience that we are talking about the topic at hand through the lens of the Wheel of Time. This is something that Aaron and I have wanted to talk about for quite some time, but did not feel like it was appropriate until we could get some outside input. You may not agree with the things we say or believe, but we do request that as much as we respect your opinions and beliefs, you return the same courtesy to us. We do not intend to offend anyone and apologize in advance if you find yourself offended. Um, There will be times in this podcast where I ask questions just to be the devil's advocate. Um, James and Sahar have already been told that and understand that. And now you know as a listener, so we can dive into this lovely discussion. So today we're going to be talking about LGBTQ plus and the Wheel of Time. And I can't breathe because I read a lot. (laughs) Yeah, that was a big, big uh, mouthful there you said. So uh, did you want to start with asking us a question? Do you want us to dive in? How do you want to do this? Um. Let's say, uh, let's start with you guys. I think that'd be a good way to start. Um, I think one of the things just to start out with would just be, um, I don't know, our qualifications as people to oh, talk sure. about this. Yeah. Um, so I am a gay man. Uh, I'm a white cisgendered gay man. Um, cisgender just means that you were born in the gender that you identify with. So not transgendered. Mm-hmm. Um, I am a lesbian or gay woman or queer uh i am pretty uh casual about the language used around me which not everybody is um but it's my personal like choice and preference that uh i'm not too picky about those labels for myself um i am also cis which means that uh i identify with the gender that i was born with and um we 
both, you know, have spent most or uh, like good portions of our lives trying to figure out uh, our sexuality and navigate the world with it. And we were both introduced to the Wheel of Time at uh, fairly young ages, and it was pretty formative for us. So, you know, there's a lot of connection there. And for those of you that don't already know, by the way, Aaron and I have talked or uh, just don't want to assume, um, I am a cisgender, heterosexual, white male, um, which, again, is part of the reason why we wanted some outside input. So it wasn't just two straight white guys talking about something that we really don't have to deal with outside of knowing people that are a part of this community. Which, by the way, can I just say, I think is really awesome of you guys and that was one of the things I really appreciated when I was reading through your outline. So thanks. Yeah, it's it's not a problem. I mean, the way I look at it is if you're in a court case, not that this is anything like a court case. (laughs) Wow. We're getting serious um, here. (laughs) I mean, you, you call in the experts because just because you know about something doesn't mean that you are exactly knowledgeable on it. You know, you don't go to um, a mathematics professor asking questions about, you know, early Renaissance political theory. This is not what they specialize in. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, and they're probably going to look at you like you're absolutely dumb. <laughs> right. And then, of course, there's the thing where if it's just Aaron and I talking about it, then like, you know, there's really easy for the counter argument. Like, well, you don't have to deal with it. You don't you haven't experienced it. You don't know what you're talking about, mm-hmm. um, which is fair. I mean, it's not an experience I've had. Right. Right. Um, I have never questioned my sexual orientation or, you know, whether I was, you know, a man trapped in a man's body or a woman trapped in a man's body or uh, whatever case have you. So um, for whatever reason, this has never been an issue that I've had to face. Um, I've had friends that have faced it and everything, but Mm -hmm. right. right. Yeah. And one thing I'd like to mention is like our experiences as uh, lesbian, gay, queer people isn't inclusive of everyone's experience. So the things we're going to be talking about, um, we aren't, necessarily experts in everything that's queer theory and queer lives so um we're imperfect as well so we might miss some things and we do apologize if we're not completely inclusive but we are doing our best yeah and if we miss something or or you disagree and you want to, uh, to talk about it um you're free to do so but there's a difference between discussing something that you didn't agree with or pointing out that hey maybe we missed something and being an all-around dick you're an all-around dick, man. You can piss off. All right. So, yeah, if it's not constructive, it's like or, half of what a dick's for. Exactly. If it's not constructive, then I'm just not here for it. Yeah, I mean, most of the guy, most of the people that listen to us listen to White Tower podcast as well. Mm-hmm. Same thing is same thing you get from Jen and Jess. Yeah, yeah. If you're gonna if you're gonna come at us sideways, then well, we're not even gonna look at you. Right. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, so. you know, it's your time. Your time's precious. Why waste it? Yeah. Don't waste time being mad over something that there's really no point in being mad over. Okay. Um, so let's kind of dive right into it. Zahar has a bit about representation and yeah. what it is. And... Do you want, so I think this ties really into a lot of what you want to talk about. So maybe I can start and you can kind of jump in with questions or points or whatever you have. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, it's pretty chill. So really just go with the flow. Great. So, you know, one of the things that we really did want to talk about is LGBTQ representation. Um, And so, of course, we want to start with what is representation, right? Um, Seems like a really basic question. It kind of is. Just trying to start simple. Um, So being depicted in whatever you're talking about, whether that's art, whether that's um, fiction, stories, media, TV shows, movies, music, uh, fashion, anything that you can think of that we as humans create um, has an aspect of representation to it. And furthermore, we can talk about uh, positive versus negative representation, right? So simply existing in a work of fiction uh, isn't always a great thing. Uh, sometimes you can... Um, you, you know, we see works of fiction that uh, constantly portray certain groups as like always the bad guy or uh, or 
they're only ever represented as showing like the basis of stereotypes, you know? Um, and so these things aren't necessarily good representation. Um, they can make people feel more isolated or hurt or make other people view them as these stereotypes. Right. So we're not interested in simply appearing in, um, media. We want to actually have positive representation. Uh, I can. I mean, I can, keep I can, I can see that. Um, if you want, <laughs> no, you're fine. okay. Just cut, cut in whatever. Oh, uh, you're fine. I mean, and by all means, like if I start talking, um, a lot of times I'll start talking mm -hmm. because it gets quiet, and I'm like, this is awkwardly quiet. <laughs> Say something. Yeah, that, that probably um, won't happen. No. This. Yeah, I, I paused <laughs> specifically to allow you to jump in if you wanted. <laughs> oh, nice. Thank you. Yeah. So kind. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, but I mean, <clears throat> uh, I had a thought, and just like that, it disappeared. Oh, just like that. But yeah, but I mean, it, it's a very valid point because nobody wants to be represented in a in a bad light necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, if you identify with whatever it is that's being um, represented, right? For well, yeah, that I don't have another phrase for. That's, it. Yeah, that's no, the word so, for it, so that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, like, <clears throat> if you identify as uh, since we're talking about LGBTQ, if you if you identify within that, um, I guess a community, then if every time you read a novel or any kind of fantasy work or any other kind of work, you can take and and if all you see are very sporadic occasions or they always wind up being the bad guy that happens to be like gay or bi or trans or whatever, mm -hmm. then you know it's you're not going to feel very welcome into the series. Um, and it's it's going to have a, a negative impact, um, even if it's only just as far as your enjoyment of the series. Exactly. And, I mean, representation, uh, it's probably coming – people are hearing a lot more about it nowadays just because – people within minorities are talking more about it because they want to see more of it. Um, but for the most part, um, cisgendered heterosexual white men are pretty well represented in every kind of media. Um, I mean, you get Superman, Batman, you get Randall Thor. If we're talking wheel of time, you get pretty much most fantasy characters. Um, all of them are pretty much straight white dudes and that's not a bad thing because straight white dudes are totally a part of the world. Um, but so are a whole bunch of other people. So. Yeah. I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's definitely something you, that I think anybody can understand. Nobody likes to be painted in a bad light um, for, for any reason. And, um, everybody wants to feel included, no matter who they are, or what they are, uh, anything like that. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, um, one thing that I think, you know, a lot of people who are fans of The Wheel of Time are also fans of Brandon Sanderson. Um, obviously, some people find that contentious, but I think for the most part, uh, we also appreciate his work. And... Um, one of the things that I have always appreciated about him and the way that he writes is that he, you know, okay, so Brandon is, is a deeply religious person in his personal life. Um, but in Way of Kings, he writes Jasna, who is an unrepentant atheist. And, you know, I remember, I, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't remember the exact quotes, but somebody asked him, like, like, Brandon, like, how did you write that? Or like, what what's going on here and his answer was that he got tired of seeing people like him represented poorly in fiction and so he didn't want to turn around and just do the same thing to a group of people that he didn't necessarily agree with like he he is uh, not an atheist at all but he wrote jasna in this incredibly believable and like well-rounded way you know she's not stupid she has arguments that make sense and all this stuff so it, there's a way to write people even if you don't believe in or agree with them as a way that doesn't just turn them into sock puppets basically yeah and i think a lot of that um has to do like with the for, for me the perspective of world building if you take a book series like 
Harry Potter, where there's really no world be- building. There's elements of a slightly hidden world that otherwise is just like the world we already know in real life. There's really not a whole lot of world sure, building yeah. to be had. People are just kind of as they are. It's a very world looking size, small series. But then when you take something <clears throat> like from like archives or you have um, Wheel of Time, where they're not just building mm-hmm. like a nation, they're building literally its own kind of globe. Then yeah. it kind of becomes one of those things like, well, there's no way no one in this entire world is like this or isn't like this. Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, I think your point is really good. Like in, in Harry Potter, we can be like, oh, well, we know what the real world is like. And so, you know, okay. So there are like, um, all these this different range of types of students that go to Hogwarts. Well, whatever. They're just people in the real world. But then once we start talking about fantasy worlds and people are like, well, why do you have to build in uh, gay people? Or why do you have to build in black people? And it's like, you know, just because it's a fantasy, it doesn't mean that it's not like our world, you know, these. And the other thing to keep in mind is that art and fiction are written for our world. You know, they're not, meant to be these separate things that exist in bubbles they're reflections of our lives and our world like that's what they are and so when we talk about what we want to see in fiction we we learn about the world through fiction yeah we do um i know for me a lot of uh, the draw for a fiction series or fiction story uh whether it's a 30 minute episode of whatever on tv or uh, an amazing 15 book series that I'm rereading again. Um, <laughs> don't know what series that could possibly be. Um, is there's 14. Yeah. Hmm? Mm-hmm. Oh, if you yeah. Can't I can't new spring, even though Sorry. I haven't read it. Okay. Okay. No, yeah. that's fine. I'm saving that's that fine. for the, for the end of the series. <clears throat> but I mean, the fantasy <laughs> aspect is it's that escape from reality. I mean, it's what yeah. makes it obviously right. different from reality. Um, and so mm-hmm. it's, and this kind of brings what I'm about to say is going to bring me to an, uh, the kind of one of the points that I know you've, you've seen on the, the Google doc here is mm-hmm. there's just like with the distraction from the real world, there's a fine balance between the real world and fantasy where it's so far fetched that it's just absolutely ludicrous and to where it's too close to real life where it doesn't feel like an escape. Um, <clears throat> mm-hmm. kind of the same thing here is. Uh, I know I've wrote the question here, playing a little bit of devil's advocate. Uh, is it fair to compel or expect artists uh, and or authors to include things you do not wish to in their works? Is it fair to judge them as intolerant or unaccepting, unaccepting if they fail to do so? And for me, the thing comes um, from there's a there's that fine line between uh, right. doing a good service to the world you're building and including things that would logically be a part of the world and Mm-hmm. You know, not feeling like you have to. It's it's like, do do you recognize that this sure. would logically be a part of your world, versus are you just adding it in because you know you've got X number of fans mm-hmm. that say you you need to add this in. Totally. I mean, I think that that's something that comes up in these conversations a lot. And you know, one thing is, um the thing that always kind of strikes me is that when people talk about this, like forced representation, I just, my question is who is doing the forcing, you know, like in, in what way are content creators being, being forced to do this? Yeah. I mean, it is a fair point because ultimately a creator is going to create what they want. I mean, there is some of that that's affected by the demand. If you create something there's no demand for, then Mm -hmm. you don't make money. Um, which right. I think for a lot of creators isn't the primary function for their creative outlet, but it's definitely a nice, I guess, uh, yeah. benefit. For it. But you know, it's not, it's not just money, right? It's also, um, if you're creating content, I mean, unless you're like some recluse that's just writing for yourself, you know, you want people to read your work and enjoy it and partake in it. And so, yeah, money is an amazing side effect given the world that we live in. Um, but it's it's all of it right like if if you create work that doesn't resonate with anybody or only resonates with like very few people then you're going to 
not be talked about as much. Your work isn't going to be read as much, you know, all of that. And so uh, when we talk about um, representation, what's actually happening is your work, you're, you're creating a way for your work to resonate with more people instead of just a particular niche market. Um, and something else is kind of, um, if it's a, to me, if it's a good enough, not a good enough story, like you don't need to hide it, but if it's a compelling enough world, if it's detailed and fleshed out and you want to be in it, I don't think inserting little bits of the real world or real life is really going to hinder anyone from wanting to continue reading or anything. Um, but in regards to kind of, kind of going back to the question, I don't think anyone's forcing anyone to do anything. I think opinions are totally like anyone can give their opinion. That's how the world works. But, and we can hold people to expectations and they don't have to do anything. They don't, it, what they do is up to them, but it's also up to us how we interpret that, how we, if we decide to continue reading their stuff, if we decide to, it's all about our personal how we handle ourselves. Yeah. Um, it's what we get to, we can choose what to do. They can choose what to do. And that's just how it is. And one thing you said um, about expectations, right? I mean, they don't, they don't, you know, writers or whoever, right. Uh, any kind of content creator, artists, they don't owe us anything, right. Just by virtue of being a content creator and us being fans of that. But likewise, we don't owe them anything. If there are people out there writing things that we find distasteful or even not distasteful, right? Like even if we just find it boring or we can't relate to it, like we don't owe them reading that work, even if they're somebody that we liked before. And so, you know, I think what happens is that a lot of times you have content creators that people really enjoy. And then they start to say, Hey, but you know what? I would really like to see you. Like, I love your work, but I would really like to see you make things that also like I can relate to a little more directly, you know, that I can see people that are like me in your work because I'm a big fan and I just want to keep like partaking in your work. Yeah. And I think with, with any content that is created, there has to come with it a, a fair understanding or at least acknowledgement of when it was written. Um, whenever right. uh, the eye of the world was published in 1990, LGBTQ sure, plus sure. issues weren't at the social political forefront like they are now. Um, <clears throat> Jordan no. being the, the southerner that he, he was, especially, you know, here down in what we call the Bible belt. Um, I mean, <laughs> yep. it is what it is. Um, those, those things, I mean, and it, it's still a bit of a struggle, uh, down here. I mean, uh, the overall climate I would say is, is far more accepting obviously than it was, but that wasn't something that Robert Jordan really grew up with, like worrying about or thinking about. It wasn't something that was in the local newspaper or on the local news really that much, um, coming up, you know, through the, the early to late, uh, 1980s writing the, the first book and then publishing it. Sure. So it's, I think it's perfectly fine to be critical of things that should have logically been included that weren't or not to a logical level. But with that, I think with the, it's like a compliment sandwich kind of thing, or not compliment sandwich, but a, a criticism <laughs> sandwich, I guess. Oh, right. Where you like compliment, criticism, yeah, compliment. You know, it's like where yeah. you, you know, you give a little bit of understanding because like this, this wasn't a part of Robert Jordan's real life world mm -hmm. really for him. Um, until he got into, you know, writing some of the later books, you know, it was just starting to become uh, a more talked about, more public issue whenever you start hitting 2004 and on. Um, but for him, it, you know, it, it was close to the end of his life whenever this became a thing. So, um, and you know, sure. Brandon Sanderson, you know, uh, has, uh, I don't want to, I say a bit of an out, but I don't mean like blameless out, but a bit of an out thing, you know, trying to just continue Robert Jordan's uh, work. So I, th I think... I mean, you know, oh, I just ahead, think like ahead. that you can be critical of a series, but you have to do so with acknowledgement to what could have affected the things that you find lacking in any series that's created or any content that's created. I mean, that's completely fair. Um, and I do think it deserves some consideration. My only issue with that, I guess, is I'm not saying he did anything completely wrong. Like, him not including openly LGB char 
characters in the series isn't the same as necessarily like oh huckleberry finn or something with the racism and the blatant disrespect towards other people it's not quite the same level but at the same time you have to kind of hold people accountable to what's okay um and i understand that what's okay kind of changes over time for some people um i mean like for me it was never okay to not treat people or to not treat people equally because of their sexuality but to some people that was okay at a certain time um so i get where you're coming from but at the same time i would say that maybe it would have been a little bit more beneficial if he were ahead of his time i guess Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And, you know, I'm actually going to kind of play the role of the apologist here a little bit. Um, I think that, uh, first of all, I think that uh, you don't give Robert Jordan as much credit as he deserves, you know, uh, in terms of the kind of stuff that he wrote about and um, the, the things that are present in his books. You know, I think that he did a lot of work to not be so overt about things and, depending on, you know, who we think his target audience was, maybe that's totally fine. For example, even if we have, um, just kind of slightly off topic, you know, if we talk about, uh, gay representation in like YA books, you know, a lot of people have issues with that. Well, you know what, like being gay doesn't mean that you have to have sex in the book. Like it can just be that you have a gay character. Um, likewise, you know, for Robert Jordan, maybe he didn't, you know, it takes a while for there to be like more racy stuff. And even when there is like, when we get like, uh, you know, snow cave, the scene, sexy glue. even that, yeah. you know, sex igloo is pretty, pretty calm considering like what we can kind of piece together actually goes on there. Um, but I think it's a lot like to build on what James said, there's a big difference between when we talk about holding people accountable for what they wrote, even if it was at a different time, there's a really big difference between being like, um, openly problematic, you know, whether that's being actually racist or being actually homophobic or being actually sexist versus what inclusion looks like. So I don't, I mean, I don't necessarily want to speak for James here, but I don't think that I blame Robert Jordan for the way that his books are written. Um, sure. It would always be nice to have more inclusion. I think that's always great, but I don't find it problematic for what, like that he wrote what he wrote in, in the specific regard of LGBTQ representation. No. And I think that's, that's totally fair. I mean, I'm on board with that. Um, I just pulled up a couple of quotes from Robert Jordan, um, just so we can touch on it a little bit in regards to what characters he did have in his books. Um, this is from his blog in, on October 6, 2005. Quote, I have gay and lesbian characters in my books, but the only time it has really come into the open is with the Aes Sedai, because I haven't been inside the heads of any of the other characters who are either gay or bi. For the most part, in this world, such things are taken as a matter of course. End quote. And then again, at a, sit, at a signing in North Sydney, um, was it New South Wales? Yeah. Okay. In Australia. In Australia, <laughs> where they live, in, um, August 30th, 1999, um, regarding gay characters, quote, they're just running around doing the things that they do. It's not the point if they're gay or not gay, end quote. So um, he did have gay characters. It's just not... I think it ties into another point you're going to have um, about them being open about their sexuality. And on one hand, um, having people that are gay, but not knowing about it is not really representation. Um, Schrodinger's gay is not positive representation to quote someone on Reddit. Like if they're gay, are they not gay? That's not representation. Um, It's important to know that someone is who they are because that means that they're comfortable in their skin. And that means that by extension, you're allowed to relate to them a little bit. You're allowed to um, tie yourself into what they're going through. It makes them more relatable. Um, I don't think anything is really taken away. If someone comes out as a gay character or a bisexual character or anything like that. Yeah. And I don't think that's completely fair, <clears throat> but um, I say, but, but um, <laughs> and I say it again. 
My my main point with the right. you know do the characters need to be openly you know uh, gay or lesbian or or bi or trans um, was more along the lines um, of Robert Jordan went through through many drafts, many edits, as did Brandon Sanderson mm -hmm. uh, using Harriet, using other editors. And there's right. always the chance that with over 2,600 named characters, that there was more explanation of the other characters, and maybe there were more characters that identify with the LGBTQ community uh, that mm -hmm. <clears throat> for story reasons, for this reason or that reason, maybe that much of a delve into their mentality and their mindset was redacted um, to kind of try to shorten the series, shorten a book. Maybe Robert Jordan thought it was getting too long. Don't know that for sure. Um, <laughs> it's it's not really super sure. relevant to acknowledge that as a possibility, and I wish the washer would stop going off for the fifth time. But <laughs> it's going off five <laughs> yeah, times, and I'm like, it. are you serious? But, <laughs> and, and yeah, it's, it's, it not, is, it it's well, not very relevant, but... It's. I, I like to explore the possibility that there may have been that. Unfortunately, they might have been that part of them might have been cut from the series for whatever reason. Yeah, and I think it's you know it's kind of a fun exercise, but maybe ultimately pointless to go back and uh, talk about what could have been in a series that's already you know written and. Um, we can certainly, you know, I think a lot of times people will get kind of caught up in the in the feelings that they have for a, a work of art or a series that they really enjoy. You know, obviously, we're all fans of the series. Like, we're here talking about it on a podcast. We're grown-ass adults talking about a fantasy series that we read in our teens. Like, we like the series, you know? Um, and so we don't want that to any kind of criticism that can come out can sometimes maybe put people's backs up because then they're like, well, you know, you're criticizing this thing that I love. And I think that those things can coexist. You know, we can, we can talk about how uh, it could have been different um, or what maybe, you know, if we play kind of the mental exercise of like, well, what if the series were being written today or in the context of the TV show, you know, that kind of stuff um, without, also discounting the fact that this is something that is very dear to all of us. Yeah. I know for me, like kind of on the same uh, track of thought is <clears throat> the, the character um, Aram is I, for the majority of the book, I honestly like, and I still believe that, um, that he's at least by, um, mm, because cause he's so hardcore. He's so hardcore like, for Barry. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, in the first book, he's so hardcore for a queen. And then mm -hmm. he comes around, picks up a sword and is like, you're a nice, big, strong man. I'm going to stay right next to you. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And I'm just like, <laughs> it's just the, the reverence he has for following Perrin. I'm mm -hmm. just like, it seems like there's just more than just a, a blind, like, admiration as far as, like, you know, his battle prowess and leadership abilities and that kind of stuff. And I mean, yeah. But, you know, Aram never is yeah. openly displayed as, you know, hey, you know, he was straight. Now he's gay or, hey, he's been bi the whole time. Right. But I, it definitely right. would not surprise yeah. me to see it. No, I mean, that's totally fair. Um, and I don't know. Should we dive into who actually is a confirmed gay? Sure. <laughs> Sorry. Confirmed I'm just gay. using my traumatic voice here. Um, so... One thing, um, you haven't read New Spring, right? Is that Andrew? Is that right, Andrew? Uh, that would be correct, but feel free to spoil anything about it for me. It's fine. It's not okay. a spoiler. I mean, it's not a spoiler, but Mor 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 oh, Jesus. Oh, Moraine Jesus. Moraine Jesus. and Suan are very gay for each other in that book. Um, and let me pull it up here. It's... Totally good. Totally should have all of this ahead of time. Uh -huh. um, anyway, they're... What are you looking for? I don't have it. Uh, anyway, um, there are mentions of, like, caresses and how Suan already always knows the right place to poke Moraine. Um, 
there are, I mean, that's where we learned that they were pillow friends. That's right? where we, yeah. well, we learned that they were pillow friends from a, um, if I recall correctly, something that Cad Suwain said about, um, Maureen and Suan being pillow friends. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then Maureen was like, how dare you talk about that? <laughs> Not because she was ashamed of it, but because she's Corinian right. and to talk about anything that yeah. happens behind closed doors in the bedroom this is, is just, private, yeah. that's not okay. Um, and I believe that's a fair logical step to make. Like, not that she was ashamed of being having a sexual relationship with Suwon, but because she just didn't talk about that. And that's just because every other Kernian is referenced as being a complete prude in public, but complete freak in the bedroom sometimes. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, you know, one of those things private is private for her. That was private, and she didn't want it talked about in public. And I, I can understand yeah. being offended by it. Right. Korean in the current Corinian in the streets and ale in the sheets. Good lord. <laughs> we need help. Um so there are a whole bunch of other pillow friends. There's um let's see here. Elida had a pillow friend, Galena had pillow friends. Well Galena was a lesbian, actually. Mm -hmm. Um Let's see here. There's two members of Chafail. Um, there is um, the, that Windfinder from the Othenmir and the Corinian Noble. Um, they had a thing where they were put to the question because they were refusing to talk about each other. Um, and that was because the Windfinder was shirking or was breaking a whole bunch of rules by having a relationship because she was married and same thing with the Corinian. They just, it wasn't necessarily that they were ashamed of having feelings for someone of their same sex. It was that they were having it was extramarital affairs. Extramarital. It wasn't um, the gay part. It was the extramarital part. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's one other reference in new spring that's super vague that says um, when the new Amarlin was sworn in, they cleared the area of men who had no liking for women at all because no men were supposed to be present. <laughs> um, I don't know. There's a whole bunch of small things there. Let's see here. There's only two named gay male characters, yeah. though. There's Lord Bald here, who is the sword bearer to the Queen of Candor. And then there's Emerin. Oh, the font is really small. Uh P Pendalen. Pendalen. He's the he's a Tyran lord and a Oshaman. So he's the guy that uh, Rand stays with in the the hand loss incident. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Because so, he lives there. He lives in that, uh, uh, that keep all by himself, that right? Manor or something. Yeah, yeah. but like so, with yeah. his servants, but like just him. Um, servants. servants. Um, but yeah, that's actually. Female sexuality is a lot more played with in the series than it is with male sexuality. Um, and that actually kind of relates to <laughs> Robert Jordan being who he is. Um, he never enjoyed writing about men being naked or sexual in any way whatsoever. Um, he, and he's pretty open about that. Um, I think that's less than ideal personally, but you know, at least he's open and honest about what it is. Um, like you see women in the series being naked <laughs> far more than you see men in the series being yeah. naked, even though they're in the same situation. Like lots uh, of heaving bosoms, lots of heaving bosoms. <laughs> um, there's mentions of in the like all the sweat tent interactions, oh, even though yeah. men are uh -huh. there, yeah. men are theoretically using them. Yeah, no, no, the um, sweat dripping down the breasts. Avienda squatting in the in the sweat tent. Um, but one of the really clear, to me anyway, representations of Robert Jordan just not wanting to write about men being naked is when Avienda and Moraine go into Rudian, they have to strip. When Matt and Rand go in there, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, you can keep your clothes on. Yeah. You have dicks. Right. That's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I never I really that, got <laughs> why there was the, the distinction or difference there. Because, like, on face value, you want to take it from the... Well, they're normally not allowed to go in, but then you're like, well, Moraine shouldn't be either right, by animal custom. Like, what is Moraine doing there, of all yeah. people? Like, so it's, if it's yeah, it's like, wh why, why did they get to keep their clothes? Like, mm -hmm. even I, like, I had no desire to see Rand or Matt naked, but 
Right, yeah. I mean, it's because Robert Jordan didn't want to write about dicks flopping about as they ran around. Like, that'd also, be weird. Can you imagine, like, the increased levels of awkward between Rand and Matt if they had had to, like, walk together naked to Viridian? Could you imagine the sunburn? <laughs> Yeah. Well, Matt's already like, I don't know, bro, you channel. I'm not, I'm not cool with that. But then like they spend that whole time they're naked. Then they, they might, it might've been like all sorts of awkward. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and if I recall correctly, I don't know. I don't think that Moraine or Avienda actually had viewpoints during those scenes. They mm-hmm. just run off and be naked mm-hmm. and do their thing. Whereas yeah. It's on Matt and Rand, so it would be awkward for him, apparently, to do that. <laughs> um, I mean, that doesn't necessarily relate directly to, like, LGBTQ, but it kind of gives a frame of mindset into how <laughs> Jordan approached nudity and, therefore, sexuality yeah. and that entire thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and it, it is an incredibly fair point um, that, you know, one side was more than adequately represented and in terms of their their nudity and the other side wasn't represented at all, you know, other than the obviously vague uh, mention. So, I mean, I agree. Yeah, it's I mean, a perfectly fair point. I mean, there are, um, if I recall, there's one scene from Cad Swain when Rand is like refusing to get out of bed because there's Cad Swain and some maidens there and he's naked. Mm-hmm. And Cad Swain's like, well, I've seen enough of your bare ass, boy, but if <laughs> other people might get a little kick out of it, you're yeah. free to get out. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, that's an instance of male sexuality because then yeah. he like jumps out of the yeah. bed and he's like, fuck all this. Yeah. Screw it. Here's my dick. Here's my <laughs> butt. Look at them. He's got a picture of him, like, um, standing, like, Superman with his, like, hand, like, fist on his lips. Right, yeah, like, okay, it was, like, you want to see this? Here it is. He was never that comfortable with his sexuality. He was never that comfortable with anything. You know, like, but... since we've kind of, like, delved into this now a bit, one thing that is kind of interesting on this point is, you know, part of what uh, Jordan wanted to do was kind of flip all these gender stereotypes on their head and we can argue about how successful he was which is a totally different podcast but um you know it is really interesting that in the series uh men are way more body conscious than women are right like they're way more shyer about being seen naked by anybody even people that they're intimate with uh whereas you know women like ale aside right like women uh strip for all sorts of ceremonies or will just undress around each other and change and take baths together and stuff right so i mean that part is really interesting that uh you know, we can speculate on why he wrote it that way, but the, you know, that is the fact that like men are in general, uh, especially the two rivers boys are way, way body conscious, um, about other people seeing them naked. Yeah. And I mean, that's very true. Um, and like, <clears throat> there's a, Robert Jordan did a very good job at incorporating different cultures and making very distinct cultures, mm-hmm. even within the Westlands. Um, right. or a lot of people call it the ran land. Um, the wetlands. Yeah. But <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, those, those scenes where, you know, uh, Rand or Matt, um, I mean, Rand or Perrin, Matt's really not that shy about being naked around most people. Um, <laughs> except for, um, what's her name? Tylan. Yeah. He doesn't want to be naked Tylan. around Tylan. And that is a whole nother podcast. Yeah. Yeah. We were to talk yeah. about that because no. yeah. Woo. Woo child. But yeah, but Rand and Perrin are, are pretty much the same way. They don't want to be naked in front of anybody or around anybody. And the only time mm-hmm. that it ever seems like Rand is actually okay with it is after some coitus with uh, you know, Elaine <laughs> or or men or yeah. or um yeah. Avienda. So I to be fair, I haven't read the earlier books in a little bit, but I don't recall much sex in the series actually happening aside from the it sex happens off glue. screen. It's all off screen. Yeah. No, I'm not saying that they're all like yeah. no, no sex. But we like bad. no so sex and glue, obviously, right? But there are like two instances one with men and one with Elaine where we know it's happened. It just happened off screen. Yeah, and those are later because I mean, even the sex and glue. I know. With Avienda doesn't come about until Fires well, of Heaven. 
Uh, but right. before that, I think there's there might be I think there's some um, at least off screen hints to it with Matt. Yeah, well, yeah, Matt's yeah. a bit of a player. I mean, um, uh, does Daughter of the Nine Moons mean anything to you? Nope. Okay, cool. Let's get down. <laughs> nope, cool. Let's let's do this. Yeah. And then when he finds her, he kidnaps yeah. her and tries to give her Stockholm syndrome, but. <laughs> Always a reliable way to get ladies. I don't know. Okay, I don't know. Yikes. I'm not the person to Yikes. talk to about how to get ladies. I would, I would not recommend or endorse kidnapping your crush. We are taking a firm anti-kidnapping stance. Yeah, I think that's like literally illegal. Yes, uh, not to mention otherwise problematic. Well, yeah. Um, um, yeah, so... I don't know. Like, do we want to, so there's a lot of, and Robert Jordan doesn't necessarily help it either, but regards to pillow friends, um, I will quote Robert Jordan on it. Um, even though I don't necessarily quite like it. Um, let me scroll down a little bit. All right. So quote from his blog in 2005, um, pillow friends are not just good friends. Oh, they are that too, but they also get hot and sweaty together and muss up the sheets. Something fierce, by the way, pillow friends is a term used in the white tower. The same relationship between men and women elsewhere would be called something else depending on the country. Um, so Jeopardy voice right there. That's my Jeopardy voice. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to tune in on that one. Yeah. Um, now whether or not that, I mean, it's basically sending girls away to boarding school. Um, and so I'm not a woman. I was never a 15 year old girl. <laughs> um, Sahar is probably better to speak to this and she will, but in this world, you're studying, you are being disciplined, you're being forced to extremes and you probably don't really have the chance to just like go out and, watch TV or play video games to relieve some tension. So to me, it seems pretty natural. I mean, I being a 15 year old boy would have probably had sex to kind of like get my mind off of things. Um, but, and that, I mean, that's probably not necessarily accurate. Sahar, I don't know if you have, I mean, so, you know, we have this, uh, paraphrased, it's not a quote. It's a paraphrase of what Robert Jordan said in, uh, at, at Marcon in May 2001, he's like, well, you put 15-year-old girls together in a tower filled with almost entirely women with their hor hormones raging on overdrive. Keep them away from men because you can't afford to lose any of them. And what do you think is going to happen? And, you know, I, I think that that's definitely a fair point. I'm not sure what conclusion he was trying to draw from that exactly. But I think, you know at the risk of getting a little too real worldy here. Um, there are actually a fair number of studies done that show that our sexualities are way more fluid than we tend to think they are. Um, and that your immediate surroundings can kind of shape, um, what you're, you know, what you're wanting to do in the moment. And so it's, it's not up to us to necessarily classify, um, everybody who had a pillow friend as, as a lesbian or as a bisexual person or whatever. But, um, you know, the fact that they, uh, were willing to engage in that kind of thing, uh, suggests that they're at least something on that spectrum. I mean, it also says that it also speaks to sexuality in that world kind of overall, um, like pillow friends are never anything that's shunned however a lot of people say that you grow out of it but i don't think it's necessarily the growing out of the sexuality it's not growing out of a woman having a relationship with another woman it's a someone who's an eyes to die who needs to be imperious yeah. I mean, needs to be a badass and reserved yeah. and can't let people close yeah and... like that there's no room for any kind of romantic relationship in that unless you're green. Right. Um, so it's just, it's not shedding the sexuality. It's shedding the distraction. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a whole nother thing. Or but... the intimacy even, you know, and like, that's why we see so few, if any, um, I Sedai that have relationships that aren't their warders. Right. 
right? It's because you can't allow that kind of, you can't allow that kind of vulnerability in your life when you are trying to conquer the world and kind of end all be all badass woman. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't know. That's one of the comments that I always hear is it's just a phase or something. And I'm like, it's not the sexuality that's a phase. It's the needing to shed all of your attachments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Cause the way like I've always read pillow friends is it's, you know, like a will of time equivalent to friends with benefits. It's, you know, we where we trust each other. We're good friends. I have needs. You have needs. Let's scratch each other's back. And, mm-hmm. and to me, the growing out of it wasn't a, well, yeah, I used to fool around with, you know, my, my fellow novices or accepted or whatever in the tower. And, you know, now I just don't enjoy that kind of thing. I think it's more of a, a move from that kind of teenager mentality of, you know, get laid by almost whoever, not almost whoever you can, but, you know, there's that push <laughs> for getting laid or whatever to a, okay, that's really juvenile. That's really stupid. Um, I don't no longer want that. I want something more. And it's a shift from the in the moment gratification to maybe more emotional attachments and more longer term gratification. Yeah, well, we I mean, you know, we know that like I said, I in general don't form relationships, whether like with with men, basically, other than uh, their borders and such because of for one because of the lifespan difference you know that's that's mentioned a couple times in the book that if you were to fall in love with anybody they would age and die well before you did um and you know so the really the only other option is um other Aes Sedai and anybody like even within your own Aja you're not really going to be that trusting of people so like unless you get lucky enough like Moraine and Swan did where they uh were very close friends um, when they were young and they were pillow friends and then they grew up and, and chose the same Aja's, you know, um, that's kind of maybe like a, an, an uncommon occurrence that they were able to stay so close. No. And I think that's kind of tangenting back to that. One of the scenes that I always remember in regards to an Aes and longevity is there's one scene and I'm, terrible with names because there's so many of them (laughs) um where an Aes Sedai is like looking on a mantle and she sees all these figurines that like represent isn't that Pavara is it I I, don't know it's she's just talking about these things that represent her family and I don't know if it was her family or her sisters or brothers children or Mm -hmm. something and their children and their children they're all dead Mm -hmm. and she's still here yeah like the white tower always remains as I think a quote from that line that um part so I think that's I mean, that speaks to those relationships that yeah. the Aes Sedai, Aes Sedai relationships, because at the end of the day, the White Tower is always going to be there to the Aes Sedai. And that, by extension, means that the Aes Sedai are always going to be there to the Aes Sedai. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like one of those, you know, you're socialized by what you're around and the, the status and condition of your life and your surroundings. And to me, that's that's very true with the Aes Sedai, Aes Sedai, not Aes Sedai, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Aes Sedai. <laughs> Aes Sedai. Yeah. But, um, you know, they know that they live longer than the average non-power-wielding uh, person. Mm-hmm. And so that's going to affect the decision-making whenever it comes to, you know, intimate or romantic partners. Right. they know, like if you know that you're going to live longer than the person you wind up getting in a committed relationship with, it's Mm -hmm. going to kind of dampen you. It's all in the back of your mind. There's always going to be that sadness that like, there's a guarantee this person is going to die. I'm going to be sad and I'm going to be, I'm going to continue living on. Yeah. Well, I mean, as a parallel to that, um, it's not exactly the same thing, but Lan, I mean, Lan always knew he was going to die, Mm -hmm. but he still, Got into a relationship with a Gwen or with a Gwen. Whoa, Jesus, whoa, whoa sorry, whoa, whoa. sorry. <laughs> uh, with Nynaeve, he always got into a rela- he. I don't know. That kind of speaks to me that even though someone knows they're going to die, love kind of prevails. But he was so reluctant, right? Like yeah. she just wore him down <laughs> because she's uh, more stubborn than he is. Yeah. yeah, but like you know, it wasn't like they both knew what was up. Like he never denied loving right. her. It was just that he wouldn't agree to a relationship and and he just kind of she just kind of you know 
was like, fuck you, we're doing this. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, he basically deliberately is, is tells her that, you know, that he does have feelings for her. He does like her, but, you know, he acknowledges the whole, like, I'm destined to die. And because I love you, right. I don't want to put you through that. Exactly. And she's like, fuck you. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, um, that's like a, um, but, you know, comparing that to like the situation like the Aes Sedai are in, especially like if we think about the tower as it was before, you know, all our main characters kind of came in and like messed up the status quo and everything. Like think about how it was before then where they had this very um, like longstanding system and everything was, you know, they were very like they meddled in everything and everybody had their secrets. And so you're just not you're just not going to have people that want to get close to anybody that um is is going to then have power over you in a way to like expose your secrets or or affect you emotionally right so um i think it makes a lot of sense that the culture then becomes that pillow friends phase out once you become a nice to die and it's it's not at all about your sexuality changing or your sexuality being seen as a childish phase it's that intimacy period is seen as a childish phase yeah or maybe just that that intimacy for the sake of intimacy that that kind of almost primal desire to do uh, certain activities that are are (laughs) x-rated yes to put it very (laughs) awkwardly um, so there was one thing that I did want to bring up, and I don't know if this uh, should be spliced earlier or whatever, but I, I wanted to talk about why representation is actually important and why it matters. Um, how do you want to deal with that? You're fine. Like, literally just about- bring it up whenever whenever you want. Okay. okay. Um, so... All right. So a little bit about why uh, representation actually matters. Um we, we talked about art and fiction, like at the beginning of the podcast, right? And this idea that um, fiction shapes how we view the real world. It's not, yeah, we make up these worlds, but the it, it's inescapable, the fact that everything that we write and create is based on the world that we know. And and we learn about the world through fiction and, and art imitates life and life imitates art, Um And we see ourselves, we see other people in the world, in our fiction. And so it's, you know, anybody that says, well, it's just a book or, well, it's just a movie or whatever, you know, that's, it's really disingenuous because it's never just a whatever. Um, these things impact our lives and our thoughts. And so, you know, there's all these, uh, thoughts about how, when when a person reads a, a work of fiction or watches a movie or whatever, right? Um, how they see themselves represented or whether or not they see themselves represented reflects on, on how they uh, then view themselves in the real world. And so back, way back in the 70s, um, these researchers, uh, so, like sociology researchers, right? They um, they have this paper titled Living with Television. It's these two guys, uh, George Gerbner and Larry Gross. And they, they coined this term called symbolic annihilation. So basically the way they said it was, this is a quote, Representation in the fictional world signifies social existence. Absence means symbolic annihilation. And so if you think about it, when you see yourself on TV or you see yourself in movies or books, it it reinforces the idea that you're a part of the world, right? Like you exist and other people acknowledge your existence. They see you and then they represent you in these things that are uh, you know, co- like works of fiction that come from their minds. When you don't see yourself, then you start to wonder, like, why don't other people see me? Like, why am I not represented in these ways? And so to that point, um, another uh, sociologist, um, Michael Morgan, um, he's like authored all these reports on uh, media effects. He says, quote, 
when you don't see people like yourself, the message is you're invisible. The message is you don't count. And the message is there's something wrong with me. Over and over and over, week after week, month after month, year after year, it sends a very clear message, not only to members of those groups, but to members of other groups as well. And so it's not just that you don't see yourself, but that other people don't see you either. And that shapes a lot of the ways that we interact with people that we might not actually come into contact with in our, in our daily lives, just because of uh, where we live or where we work or, you know, whatever, through no fault of our own. And fiction allows us to come into contact with people that we might not otherwise. Yeah. Just, and this is, sorry, go ahead. No, that's it. I mean, I have way more, but I was pausing. Oh, I, I know I can see, <laughs> which I love. I love whenever I'm like, hey, would you like to come and talk about things? And you're like, I'd love to talk about this. And then you're like, here's what we have prepared. And it's like, this is great. There's plenty of stuff to talk about. Um, but yeah, some of the classes I took in college uh, were mm -hmm. sociology classes, and I, and I loved them. Love sociology. Yeah. It's an incredibly yeah. important uh Discipline. There we go. It took me a second to find the word. <laughs> the thing, it's the just picture, thing. Yeah, I just picture my brain like a Rolodex is going through like, nope, 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 nope. There's the word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a really old Rolodex. But the, the things about things like sociology, uh, sociology by definition, well, not by definition, but by virtue of what it is, incorporates an absolute shit metric fuck ton of the technical term, philosophy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the technical term, metric shit tone. Not uh -huh. empirical, metric. Metric, it's metric, yes. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> but there, there's so much philosophy and theory. Oh, for uh, sure. That has to go into it. And theory not being the question of things are or aren't, but the you can't definitively say that there's a correlation. It, you, you get what I'm trying to say. Sure. I mean, you know, I, we can talk about hard science versus soft science and the... Um, you know, rigidity of these studies done and what was their sample size and the statistical uncertainty. But like at the end of the day, you know, um, I don't, I don't think sociology is trying to pretend to be, um, like physics, you know, they're, uh, what they're doing is they're categorizing, they're, they're pooling people's experiences. And so, you know, you can, you can either say, well, um, that's not enough people's experiences, or you can say, Oh, okay. Well, there are people that absolutely experience this and that's important. Well, yeah. And it's not, there's nothing that you can ever take and empirically prove other than, you know, surveys to a degree are in, are, can be empirical proof. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you that don't know what empirical proof is, that means like pure by the numbers, like you can prove two plus two equals four. Um, but yeah, I mean, the things like that, if, if you never see something that relates to you, then that's going to have uh, effects on your psyche, on your mentality, on what's on your perception of yourself. Because right. if you watch tons of shows, read tons of books, mm -hmm. do whatever, and you never see someone, even, you know, anyone similar to what you identify as, whether that's sexual orientation, gender, name a category. Mm hmm then you're going, it's it, by proxy makes you feel like you're the, uh, the outsider, the outcast, the weird one, the, exactly. there's something wrong with you that you're different yeah. than everybody else. And you should yeah. just keep that quiet. For sure. Uh, which and, you know, is, it's horrible. I mean, cause and, we see this, not just go ahead make your point. Oh, I was going to say, you know, it's not, it's not just, I mean, that is absolutely, um, an awful effect, you know, the personal, but it's not, it's not just personal too, you know, it's how, um, we see each other. So, um, this historian, uh, Carlos Cortez, uh, so he wrote this book, the children are watching how the media teach about diversity. And he has this, um, you know, quote that he says, First, w whether intentionally or unintentionally, both the news and entertainment media teach the public about minorities, other ethnic groups, and societal groups, such as women, gays, and the elderly. Second, this mass media curriculum has a particularly powerful educational impact on people who have little or no direct contact with members of the groups being treated. So again, when you don't see particular people in your day-to-day -day life, which, 
you know, that is very frequently through no fault of your own. It's where you grew up. It's where you live. It's, it's a lot of different things that people don't necessarily have direct control over, but when you're not exposed to, um, you know, a, a very, um, like a multitude of different kinds of people, but you live in a country and especially in this day and age where we're also connected over the internet, over social media, you know, all this stuff, um, you, you, you encounter them and you have to make decisions in your life around them, but you haven't had that personal exposure, you know? And so uh, uh, the way that the media and fiction do that is by representing these groups and making these things just kind of normal. They're just people that you see. Yeah. I mean, that's how things go from the, that's really fucking weird to yeah. the, oh, okay, that's just how you are. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, mainstream. That yeah. yeah. Oh, I read about yeah. that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Everything about. that's new or different, especially yeah. on a person-to-person basis, has to be normalized. Mm-hmm. If it is something that should be normalized. So we can all agree, pedophilia is not something that should no, ever be yeah, normalized. we're going to not normalize okay. the fuck yeah. out of that. We're going to, so, in fact, anti-normalize that. Yeah. And I make sure to make the point, because yeah. there are people that are like, well, if you normalize this anything then where where do you put the, the stopper at i think sure. we can all agree I that think there's that, a line yeah we can yeah. you know what maybe there's some like wiggle room exactly where that line is drawn but you know this whole idea of a slippery slope right like we can make moral judgments like we we can draw lines and we can say these things are not okay if if we allow normalization we don't have to normalize everything the things that we think are bad are still bad oh yeah um and, and i agree I, th- I think society in general mm-hmm. is able to come together and by virtue of you know things like facebook and twitter and right. just the the mass interaction that we have now that's so easy to have mm-hmm. um you could literally go right now and just make a YouTube video, post it, and I mean, it may take a while, but it can be seen by the story. But yeah. you know, yeah. But I mean, yeah, society I think can ultimately decide that that line of okay, this is morally right, this is morally wrong, right? As uh, as a society, as a group, and as any civilized body should. Mm-hmm. So. I will admit, uh, with the with the Gerbner and and Gross uh, paper, living with television, mm-hmm. I, I see the point from the the last section. The absence means symbolic annihilation. Mm-hmm. I disagree because I don't see it as so black and white, so cut and dry. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I mean, no, and I don't. Necess- I mean, that's why symbolic is in there. I think. Um, I mean, that doesn't mean that if you don't see gay people on television that gay people are going to stop existing um it's not that's definitely not black and white it's saying that if you don't see gay people except for this one really campy villain on a tv show that's pretty much what you're going to think all gay people are like um and you know one thing that's actually kind of interesting and um about talking about this stuff. So that paper in particular, it's from 1976. So this predates the internet. Um, it predates any sort of quickly mass marketable, you know, sure. You had movies, you had TV shows, you had newspapers, but all this stuff was, um, it, it doesn't have the turnaround time that we have today. And so at the time it very much was that, uh, you had a very small selection of media to choose from. Whereas right now, like I could go find the most niche YouTube video or comic book that I want. That's like about some very specific topic and I can read it and I can see people that look like me or people that look like my friends or whatever. Right. But back in the day, um, if, if you didn't, if, if you weren't seeing yourself, um, in the Hollywood movies or the TV shows that were on like the four cable channels or, you know, you didn't exist. Like you weren't a person in the world because how is anybody supposed to know that you existed if they didn't see you in real life and they didn't see you on, on TV or the movies. And it brings kind of the, the subject of identity into the whole equation. Um, 
like for me, I, I'm 28. I grew up kind of in the weird time where being gay in middle school was the thing that you made fun of. But then a year later, it was the thing that was cool. Um, (laughs) So it was really weird for me. So I kind of remember seeing both sides of it, but For me, having gay role models or something is something for me to say, oh, I don't have to create and forge this whole identity about what being gay is or what I mean, I you do to an extent like being gay is different for everyone or being queer is different for everyone. But at the same time, it gives people those role models to kind of look at um, and to see themselves represented is it's more powerful than a lot of people think. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And with going into representation, uh, I don't want to, we, we've talked a little bit about uh, one of the points that Aaron has put in the show prep in terms of like percentages, role work versus uh wheel of time. Is it all right to compare them? Can we even compare them? Right. Um, is uh, just doing some quick Google looking up statistics. Mm hmm. Uh, if you look up uh, Wikipedia, which we all know is the most reliable source out there oh, on yeah, the internet, totally. of course. I mean, that's never wrong. You know, or, I mean, uh, that's just, that's like the... That's the empirical proof we were it talking is. about yeah, earlier, guys. It totally yeah. Is. yeah, so the, the, on on Wikipedia, and I have another source. Just no, it's to, fine. Yeah, Wikipedia is a great like, number. First quick, yeah. You know, it's here, it's talking about a 2017 Gallup poll that concluded that 4.5% of adult Americans identify as LGBTQ, with 5.1% of women identifying as LGBT, compared mm-hmm. with 3.9% of men. Mm-hmm. A different survey in 2016 from the Williams Institute estimated that 0.6% of U.S. adults identify as transgender. Again, that's out of 370 million is what we're at now, I think, somewhere around there. Sure. Yes. Uh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Like numbers. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's conducted yeah. at varying. I mean, but then again, you know, this gives no sample size, and this isn't a question that's asked in the U.S. Census. No. So, uh, go ahead. So I went over and, and looked at. Uh, I'm looking at this other article that's on uh, Daily Beast, titled "Just How Many LGBTQ Americans Are There," mm-hmm. and. It acknowledges that the estimated size of the U.S. LGBT population is, as a whole, is getting closer to the "quote unquote" legendary one in ten number. <laughs> we were just talking about that before the podcast yeah. when we yeah. saw that question. We were like, "Well, is it 1995? Because then it's 10 percent if it's yeah. 1995." Yeah, yeah. I mean, they they talk about that they used Gallup data taken from interviews with over 1.6 million adults. Right. Um, and demographer or demographer uh, Gary J. Gates reported that 10 million Americans or 4% of the population now identify as LGBT. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that includes a record high 7.3% of people born between 1980 and 1998 who now identify as LGBT, mm-hmm. which is up from 5.8% in 2012. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, those questions all, they're like um, the a really big thing that they, you know, obviously they control for a lot of stuff. You know, they're, I don't know how much about polls, you know, you can actually use a fairly small sa- sample size and get a really accurate statistical uh, representation. But one thing that they can't do is they can't ask minors. And right now, the current generation, the people that are under 18 right now are one of the most like, uh, sexually liberated generations in terms of their identities. Um, they like these kids are incredibly okay with, um, being fluid with not identifying exactly what they are for just like basically like living their lives how they want and not super worrying about, uh, what to call themselves. And even as you know, like, so I think, I don't know exactly how you are. Um, you know, we're both millennials here, you know, and our generation's pretty cool with it, but like even the younger you go, like the more open everybody is. And so I think that once a lot of the kids right now that are, you know, in in middle school and high school age into adults, you're going to actually see a lot of those numbers go way up. Uh, another thing is just kind of, Speaking to that, I guess, like when you talk about people who are a little bit older that didn't have that representation, that didn't know anything other than gay was bad or queer was bad or anything like that. If they had any of those kinds of thoughts, I mean, suppressing things is not healthy, but it's a very effective way of 
controlling your urges, I guess, for a really, really, really poor way of phrasing that, I guess. Um, so they wouldn't have explored those thoughts that they had, whereas kids today are just like, huh, that boy's cute. Am I gay? Does it matter? No, not really. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think that humans or anything are changing. I think that the exposure and learning and understanding of what LGBTQ plus is, is definitely evolving a lot. And that's making people realize that, Hey, it's okay. It's not, you're not going to, well, depending on who you talk to, you aren't going to go to hell. You aren't going to go to jail or anything like that for having those thoughts. So. Yeah. And I think ultimately in the end, the, when you look at the morality question of it, it doesn't really matter if it's a low percentage or a high percentage of any society that identifies as part of this LGBTQ plus community, it, that it's it's all about, I think it's a better frame of mind is put yourself into something you identify as mm-hmm. um, that, you know, would you want that part of you to be persecuted or to be disacknowledged or to, you know, just be frowned upon in general or not even, you know, well, I already said disacknowledged. We're going <laughs> to yeah, assume yeah. that's a word. I I think that it makes perfect sense. So whether or not it's a word, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. So, but to to the question, I don't think we can compare the the quote unquote numbers in between the Wheel of Time and the real world. Because for one, we don't know the total population in the Wheel of Time. Um, we don't get into the you know assume Kyrian has. I don't know, 750,000 people. Let's just assume uh-huh. that uh-huh. we, we've get in the heads of like, what, like maybe 20 total people that are Korean or identify as from right. yeah. uh, Korean. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's we, the data is not the fictional data is not there from this fictional series right. to be able to compare. Data. No, there is not. Cause if you, if you take just the, the known identified, um, LGBT or LGB uh, characters from the series, it literally fits on one PowerPoint slide quite easily. Yeah, and right. if you use that as a percentage against an unknown population just in the Westlands, mm-hmm. it's it's going to be incredibly low percentage. Yeah. And that, I feel like it, it wouldn't represent what the actual fantasy world would have. Yeah. And, you know, I think that once when you talk about representation, um, I think that once you start getting into the realm of like playing the numbers game, I think that you really do everybody a disservice, you know, because um, people who are skeptical about representation are going to start really kind of being like, well, okay, like, how did you come to those numbers? Like, what does that mean? Like, what what percentages? Why does the number have to mirror the real world? Blah, 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 you know? And and people who want representation are like, you know what? Like, I don't actually care what the statistics are. Like, I just want to see people on screen that look like me. And I want those people that look like me on screen to be fully fleshed out, interesting characters, not just kind of one dimensional sock puppets, you know? Um, And so I think, you know, we can definitely talk about, oh, well, like here's the laundry list of characters and what percentage is that. But I don't, I'm not sure that it really helps anybody on, on anywhere in the, um, you know, arena of opinions about this topic. Yeah. For me, ultimately uh, talking about on the screen, mm-hmm. it's a good segue into talking a little bit about the TV series. Oh yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Because Robert Jordan has publicly decreed mm-hmm. that this does, that the concept of, you know, the pillow friends and same sex mm-hmm. relationships yeah. does exist in other areas and other cultures. Right. This could be, that, that is a perfect justification as if one was needed for <laughs> Rafe and the other members of the the production team, uh, the, the consultants. Um, I, obviously, I don't know all their names. I mean, I've seen right. all their names. I just can't. I do get to remember names of people I've met like today. It's a very, it's, which is uh, awesome. It's very exciting how fast it's growing. I mean, it's they, they're in the unique position to include this representation in the series. Um, really? I'm one of those people that I like to see screen adaptation, adaptation, stay as close to the source <laughs> material 
as possible. But there are so many characters whose sexuality isn't even explored, isn't even talked about, not to mention the miscellaneous populace. I mean, if, if Rand and Matt make it into Camelin and, you know, one out of every 15, 20 couples, whatever, just walking around is like two dudes or two chicks or whatever holding hands. You're right. Yeah. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine. It's, it's a realistic sure, depiction yeah. of not what like we've that. come to know in society. Yeah. And it's not going to. I mean, it's not going to bother anyone. And I think that for LGBTQ plus people, it's going to be like, oh, hey, look, there I am. Yeah. Um, so regarding, Rafe has only said one thing um, in regards to LGBTQ plus people in his world. Um, and that was during, in his world, sorry, in the television series. And that was during his September um, Twitter Q&A where he answered like 280 questions. Um, and I mean, if you want to, check out the entire transcript we do have it at tarvalon.net <laughs> sorry to plug ourselves completely um but anyway right. i'll ask you to do it again at the end too oh, no we'll, we'll do it now too we'll just spread it out um <laughs> so we asked everyone got one question and because i'm the director of marketing and sahar is in charge of twitter we decided to ask what the, his thoughts and plans were regarding lgbtq representation in the television show there's some in the books like hello friends and we know how much it matters to be represented in media his response was quote i think that gender is such a key theme of the books and discussing gender without the full representation of lgbtq plus people would be a disservice to that discussion rest assured there will be pillow friends out the wazoo the wazoo <laughs> what so, technical anatomical part is the it wazoo? is it is yeah um it's actually a show business term mm -hmm. yeah yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think it's where he decides to go with that. I mean, that's kind of up to him where I would love to see that go. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, I don't know. I'm pretty radical. I'm not quite as we need to stick to the books page by page as some people are. Um, I think as long as the story remains intact that I... I'm going to be pretty happy with it. Um, I'm mostly pretty happy with people being exposed to the wheel of time and which will allow our fandom to grow. Um, because yeah, I mean, we have Jordan con, um, we have all these communities that are about the wheel of time, but it's kind of, it's been dwindling a little bit in the past few years. So having a new injection of fans is going to be a pretty exciting thing. Mm hmm. And, you know, for me personally, I think that there's I think it'd be really awesome to see kind of like what we were just talking about with extras in the backgrounds that are you have gay couples or lesbian couples or, you know, somebody is uh, trans or, uh, you know, whatever, just like kind of going about their lives being people and it doesn't matter. They just are um, LGBTQ. Um but also, in addition to that, you know, I think that it would be really great to have some on-screen named character representation as well, where we can kind of bond with a character that we see throughout multiple episodes who has a story arc. And whether that's the slight adjustment of already known characters or whether that's the introduction of a new character or however the team ends up wanting to do it, you know, um, I just, I think it would be really lovely to see that. I personally, I guess I am a little bit of a stickler. I wouldn't want to see a new character inserted because I personally hated Toriel and the Hobbit, but I mean, that's my <laughs> own little beef. I don't want this like random insertion of a gay guy or a lesbian woman. Random I want an insertion of a gay guy. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I love my biography. Yeah, it is. In stores 2020. Please see Barnes and Noble. Um, Kind of something that we didn't actually talk about, which uh, we probably should have before we started talking about, um, I guess, the TV show. And I'm not. So in regards to transgendered people, um, transgendered people don't exist in the Wheel of Time. Um, and to quote, I mean, so Robert Jordan said that gender, um, like the ability to channel, is a soul attribute, meaning that the soul can never be reborn with a gender that is different than its body. Essentially... That means that transgendered people don't exist. 
Um, the quote that we're referencing is from a signing in the Netherlands in 2001. Um, someone asked, this is in regards to the possibility of a female Dragon Reborn. Um, they said the soul would always be male. Souls don't change gender. So, And then Robert Jordan continued, so the soul of the Dragon Reborn is always going to be male, just as Birgit's, Birgitta's soul is always that of a woman, and Amaresu's soul is always born of a woman is always born as a woman. There are divisions here and they are not interchangeable. So whether you want to view that as affirming in the sense that you wouldn't have to go through a lot of what transgendered people have to go through, um, you can. Um, it's also a lack of representation towards our real world where transgendered people do exist. Um, sorry, do you want to yeah, so just to like cut in. So one thing, um, you know, at the very start of the podcast, James and I both uh, said, so we are both cis. And so this is an area where neither of us really has the expertise, the life experience, any of that to um, talk about what might be desired. I did reach out via my uh, personal Twitter account to uh, ask a few trans people that I am mutuals with or who are in my network um, what they thought. And, um, you know, I kind of, there was one person who she had um, read the first couple books of the series, but uh, she didn't really remember it. But like, I kind of was able to um, jog her memory a little bit by talking about it. There's another person who uh, they had not, read the series at all. And so I kind of gave them the rundown of what was going on. Um, and, you know, both times, like this idea of the fact that like, uh, gender is very much tied to the soul was like, Whoa, that's, uh, weird. And how does that work? And why, you know, why is that the case? And talking about going forward, like what could be done in the TV show, I mean, this is incredible, all speculation. These are my personal opinions. I don't know what Rafe and his team are going to decide to do, you know, all that stuff. Um, but one thing through talking with some people and kind of bouncing my own thoughts off of them and hearing what they had to say, um, something could be done where we slightly adjust canon a little bit and we say, well, actually, you know what? Um, maybe that whole gender soul gender to body gender thing isn't a perfect match all the time. Maybe sometimes um, it doesn't match. And then, so your like soul or your essence is one gender and your body is another gender. And so now you have this, um, you know, feeling of, of not, not looking like who you are. Um, it's not, you know, given that we know way more about the metaphysics of Randland than we do about our real world. And we don't know how a lot of this stuff works in our real world. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say that that's a, like an exact trans analog, but it, it could be a way to get some representation in there, um, in, in a way that also explores the interesting aspects of Robert Jordan's world. And I mean, kind of to that point, like I, I'm not sure if most people know that trans people per canon don't exist, but that's not a big part of canon. If we want to, to change yeah. any part of canon. To and just it. to head off, Arangar is not trans. Yeah. Uh, if we, I don't know. Do you want to touch more on that? Or um, Basically, Arangar is put into a woman's body as halfway as a punishment and halfway as like a no choice. And he continues to identify um, as a male. And like, it's not, he was never... It, it's and he's like it's done by the will of the dark one like in in every way it's neither positive representation and it's not um analogous to like a, a trans person's experience in our world and so in every way except for the fact that you have a person who is a guy in a body that has breasts and a vagina like um yeah, Arangar is not trans. It's not trans not representation. Trans. Yeah, exactly. It's trans as an identity, whereas Arangar, what happened to Balthamel, um, was a punishment, which, I mean, personally, if you ask me, is super fucked up that that's a punishment, according to the Dark One. Um, but 
I mean, that's <laughs> he's the dark one. He's yeah. not the I'm the nice guy. Right. He's not. <laughs> uh-huh. He's not Mister like morally on the up and up. You know. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> with Arangar, I would I would make the argument. You got to hear me out on this one. For anybody that just heard the phrase right. argument yeah. and was like, "Oh God, I'm gonna kill you." I kill you. My no. statement is. Uh, you have uh, Bothamel, as you say, that gets forcibly reincarnated as Arangar, who we first meet as Helma and Saladar, that mm-hmm. is forced into a female body, and he hates it, he doesn't like it, he wants a male body again, is part of Arangar's motivation to do the best job they can to hope to get rewarded mm-hmm. with a penis again. Right, so, as we all attain. Yeah, all right. as we all- so I think that while not identifying Arangar as transgender, that it can be indicative of at least a portion of the struggle that some or most or all, uh, obviously me not being a part of the community wouldn't know, uh, the transgender people go through, you know, this, the dark ones forcing could be that kind of societal expectation that you are what you are because you are, and that's it. And the, and the knowledge that, that Arangar's knowledge that I am not who I am not the gender that I look like I am. I don't want to be the gender that I mm-hmm. look like I am. I want I want to be the gender that I know I am down deep inside. Mm-hmm. I think we can identify with that part of the struggle while also acknowledging that Arangar is not truly transgender, but does to at least some extent experience at least a portion of the struggle that transgender people would in the real world. Totally. I mean, so here's the thing, right, is we can draw all sorts of analogies to the various struggles of different characters in the book to real world things. Um, there's uh, this like great um, an, a, like analogy, like Rand's uh, farm boy to Dragon Reborn arc is a great analogy for somebody coming out as gay. Like he's he's shunned by his friends like his friends think he's weird he uh has a lot of self-doubt and like guilt about uh his ability to channel um he constantly says things like um no i can't i mean i didn't do it on purpose it just happened i don't want to channel the power i won't do it ever again i swear you know like all these things and then his eventual um like acceptance you know like all these things are are extremely analogous to to um, a person who comes out of the closet as gay in a uh, conservative family or a, a somebody who is um, surrounded by like religious friends and family or something like that, right? So sure, you know, we can say that there are some similarities uh, between Arangar's struggle and uh, real world trans experiences. But the question here is, does Arangar count as trans representation? And the answer to that is going to continue to be no, because again, even if we say that the experience is in these ways analogous, it's not positive representation. Um, in some ways, it's extremely stereotyped because for one, um, not every trans person uh, wants to pass as the gender that they are, you know, like somebody, like if a person is a trans man, he may not really care um, if he looks what we like consider stereotypically male, uh, for instance, um, there are non-binary trans people who are neither male nor female. And so like all this stuff, um, and then, you know, on top of it, the idea that um, Arangar's quote unquote transness, like supposed transness, comes from purely the will of the like most evil thing right. that exists in the universe. Like this is all sorts of messy. And so, you know, we can definitely say, well, like, sure, here's the struggle um, that uh, characters have, and here's how it's analogous to some real world struggles. But, but calling anything like that trans representation is, in my opinion, um, incredibly inaccurate. Yeah, and, and I would agree. <clears throat> I, I definitely would agree, and I can see the point. Um, yeah. Like I said, like, I, I wasn't arguing that Arangar was. No, 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 no. no. We're no, just addressing your I, point. Yeah. Jeez, Christ, my freaking audio just spiked. I just saw red on my screen. Oh, yeah. No, like, I, you just, yeah. No, you're fine. Ah! Yeah. No, I, I know you guys weren't. But, mm-hmm. you know, I was. sometimes I reiterate the points for anybody that might have, like, tuned out for a second. <laughs> 
I yeah. just heard us yelling at them. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's, no, that's fair. fair. We, we do that. Yeah. I also monologue. So yeah, you're fine. I, mean, I, I wanted to touch on, I mean, Rand's arc. Um, I mean, this wasn't something I realized until I actually started researching for this podcast really, but it fits perfectly um, in regards to how he is just this dude as a farm boy. And like, there's this scene in the great hunt. Um, Sahar quoted the first part where he's denying that he is using the power or he didn't do it on purpose, that it just happened. He doesn't want to do it again. He swears it. And like, that's pretty much what happens when you are shaming the idea that you're gay. Um, Oh, I had a gay thought. I won't do it again. I promise not to do it. And then to continue the quote um, from that passage, you don't want to, the Amerlin seat said, well, that's wise of you and foolish too. Some can be taught to channel. Most cannot. A few though have the seeds in them at birth. Sooner or later, they wield whether they, they wield the one power, whether they want to or not as surely as Roe makes fish. You can make continue, you will continue to channel, boy. You can't help it. And you had better learn to channel, learn to control it, or you will not live long enough to go mad. The one power kills those who cannot control its flow. How am I supposed to learn? He demanded. Maureen and Varen just sat there, unruffled, watching him like spiders. How? Maureen claims she can't teach me anything, and I don't know how to learn, or what. I don't want to, anyway. I want to stop. Can't you understand that? To stop. Um... Again, from The Great Hunt. Um, to me, that's a very... That's like a very emotional scene, reading it through the lens of mm-hmm. putting it through my history as a gay man, other people's histories as gay boys growing up in religious households, in religious communities, or not even religious, but less open-minded communities. Um, and it's further reiterated by Matt later on, um, a couple, few chapters later, um, his quote from the series, uh, Matt hesitated, looking sideways at Rand. Look, I know you came along to help me, and frankly, er, and I am grateful, I really am, but you are just not the same anymore. You understand that, don't you? He waited as if he expected an answer. None came. Finally, he vanished into the trees, back towards the camp. Um, and that's kind of... Um, what happens mm-hmm. when you come out? Um, some people are okay with it to varying degrees. Some people are happy for you. Some people are sad and think that you're better off. I mean, it would be better off if you had died or something. Mm-hmm. That's a real thing that a lot of queer young people go through. Um, and it's really unfortunate. But looking at it through that lens is really impactful to me personally. And I'm sure if I... I don't know, more aware young gay men are reading the Wheel of Time. They'll see it way <laughs> earlier than I did because it's pretty pretty much what happens when you come out. So, Yeah, I mean, and uh, I can <clears throat> I, I can see it. I thought I was going to, like, say something different. Like, a lot, yeah, still, like, the same something. thing, but, like, myths in this, my brain was like, but what if you said it this way? And then it was like, wait, what way? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all kind of like flagging here. We've been going at it for almost two hours. Yeah, yeah, we have. Um, so I think this is a good time to start getting in some some final point, some final points. Yeah. Please. Sure. Um, so do do you guys have any final points you want to bring up or talk about? I don't know. Did you have Did you have any thoughts that you wanted to wrap up with that we could kind of play off of or? Um. So my my overall kind of final thought and, and it's the same uh, generally any discussion I have about this kind of topic is that in the end it's, it's all about the fairness it's all about the you know quote unquote golden rule do unto others as you would have others do unto you kind of thing that mm-hmm. you know just as it's fair to acknowledge people's differences in sexual orientation and activities and the like that it's equally as important to acknowledge people that are gender binary that are, you know, that are, I guess, sexual orientation normative. We're going to say that very loosely going from the the historical socio norm of the United States of heterosexuality being the normative in terms of sexual orientation. Um, That the, the difference comes in, 
your whether well in the persecution as far as the socioeconomic uh, socio political rather repercussion repercussions one of these days I'll learn how to speak English. <laughs> um, that you know we see in the world of time that we don't see anyone persecuted for having a same sex relationship. Uh, though it it does appear to be heavily on the back burner for the most part, um, you know, just like with the polyamorous tradition of the IL, you know, no one's really penalized for it, which is great. But you know, most of your Westlanders are scandalized. They're like, "What?" <laughs> so I think it's, but ultimately they they come to get used to it as they're exposed to it as it becomes more normative to them. So I think ultimately mm-hmm. it's that kind of live and let live you know, lest you do harm kind of mentality that at the end, people are the way they are for various reasons, because they are born that way, because they are, uh, something's happened in their life to either make, uh, allow them to realize something or change how they believe in something that ultimately we, we have a tendency to get up in arms, to start shouting, to start calling names, to start saying these ugly, nasty things about people that aren't the same as us for really no reason when it doesn't impact your life at all. Um, Mm -hmm. I came up in a, a Southern Baptist Christian uh, household and it's, it's still the religion I, um, I hold to, but Mm -hmm. we're sitting here having a fantastic discussion and I don't care that the two of you are gay Mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, it does not affect my life whatsoever. You're happy with how you're living your life. That's fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that. And if I think if that's the dialogue that we can keep as a society, global, you know, global ultimately, but also as an American society or whatever society you might be listening uh, to this from is we're so easy. It's so easy to get angry and upset about things that really don't affect our life or don't have those repercussions that harm us as those that are already accepted in society and you know how much you want to be accepted as an individual so treat other people the same way their life choices or their how their life is is the way it is for things you don't know you can't possibly know and frankly you Mm -hmm. don't need to know if you have a friend that comes to you one day and says hey i think i like you know and it's a guy and says hey i think i like guys or a girl says hey i think i like girls and like cool fantastic good for you uh, I've had female friends that came up to me and be like, yeah, you know, I, I've tried guys. I don't really care for it. I like women more. I'm like, cool. We can talk about which girls we think are hot together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's one of those things like live and, and let live. There's there's no need for the ugliness that we see so often, uh, especially on social media, but uh, in mm-hmm. society in general, there's, there's no need for it. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we i think that to kind of summarize what we've been talking about we want we want to see um we want representation we want people that are like us that whether whether you're talking about lgbtq whether you're talking about race whether you're talking about just gender like we want to see um you know as a woman i i who likes fantasy and comic books and science fiction like i want to see more female characters in those in those genres you know because i want people that look like me it's not that i hate dudes um it's just that i think that when when sometimes you know i think the conversation gets stuck on this point that people worry that it, when you ask for representation that you're also asking to get rid of them and I don't think anybody here is asking to get rid of dudes or to get rid of straight people. Like this is all, you know, we're all part of society. And so adding representation doesn't take away from what's already there. And so we can have it where um, the the straight dude sees the straight dude and is like, cool. And the uh, gay woman sees the gay woman is like, cool. And then we can also see each other and we can be like, oh, look, like this is what the world looks like. Like there's a variety of people in it, you know? And I think for me, um, I guess what I would like people to take away is that the wheel of time is already pretty queer. Um, I mean, it's not, 
in your face. And I don't think that's what anyone is really asking it to be. Um, I don't expect to have any, I don't expect to have Rand hook up with a dude in the middle of the show. Like that's not what I'm asking for. What I'm just saying is the wheel of time is already really queer. You have sexuality is a lot more fluid than we ever think it is because we put our real world, what we view as the norm into that when it might not be exactly what it is. Um, Per Robert Jordan, sexuality is just a lot more fluid there. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's really, really, really important. Um, If the creator of the canon says that something is the way it is, then that's just the way it is. Um, Moraine and Suan, they hooked up. Mm -hmm. Um, People, pillow friends are serious things. Um, It's not... It's not a bad thing, and it's not something that we're, I am necessarily asking that people change. I'm just asking that it be sh- it show up a little bit more prevalently than it did in the books. Because um, by Robert Jordan's own admission, he didn't say what characters were gay and what weren't. Um, he didn't say um, how a certain character feels about someone else. He was pretty pretty prudish a little bit aside from the whole you know sweat running down bosoms and everything (laughs) in regards to sex he was he didn't insert it very much um Ah, but (laughs) yeah um that needs to stay in oh i guess it can be real is there a blooper reel jesus um (laughs) yeah so me 2019 robert jordan just didn't insert it very much when it came to sex (laughs) it's really great um i don't know i think it's it's there more than people realize and i think it's important that we acknowledge it okay (laughs) yeah um so uh, that's all i really have okay is this the part where i plug Oh, yeah, we got to do the plug. Yeah. Feel free to plug anything and everything you want. We're already talking about insertion we and might sex, as well talk about so plugs. plugs. I mean, that's a natural segue. <laughs> um, I am going to be at JordanCon this year. I'm going to be doing a panel with Therese um, and Ebony Adamanis, who runs the Big Wheel of Time group on Facebook, on diversity, um, which includes... Um, diversity in the wheel of time, which includes um, gender and sexuality, uh, as well as racial diversity. Um, Ebony is a very strong, proud black woman, so she'll be handling a lot of the racial diversity, and I'll be handling a lot of the uh, sexual diversity that's in the series. Um, so if you want to check that out, I schedule hasn't been released yet, but that will be there. Um, and then to kind of plug Tarvalon.net a little bit, um, we've been around since 2001. Um, we're coming up on our 18th anniversary, which we're having a party for in, God, less than a month now. Um, we've been around. We have a forum um, that's kind of strongly... Uh, our forum structure relates strongly to the books. Um, you kind of rise through the ranks, junior, like citizen of Tarvalon, novice or accepted, or I'm sorry, novice or recruit, accepted or soldier, I said I or Gaideen. Um, it's definitely a very close knit community. Um, we kind of have four main points. We have our online community, which is done through forums. Um, we have a, we're launching a Discord server soon. Um, and then, We also have our real-life community. We have three real-life events throughout the year, um, official ones, and then we have a strong presence at JordanCon. There's also a lot of local meetups um, just for where people are situated. Um, We have our library. Uh, Team Jordan actually referenced the library when completing the series, and that's something that we will never, ever, ever stop bragging about, (laughs) um, ever, because when Maria told us that, we kind of lost our shit. Um, and then we have our philanthropy. Um, I said I translates to servants of all in the books, um, in the old tongue. And we kind of give a lot to charities of various kinds. Um, we host the Robert Jordan Annual Memorial Scholarship for undergrads and graduate students. Mm-hmm. Um, so if anyone is interested in that, it'll come up, I think, in September. I might be completely wrong. That's not my department. Uh, um yeah, no, we're pretty cool. Check us out. If you have any questions, you can reach out to us on Twitter. Um, our handle there is at Tarvalon. Mm-hmm. And then on Facebook, we're just Tarvalon.net. Um, 
or you can reach out directly however you want. Yeah. Yeah, and they are fantastic people. I literally sent the email saying like, hey, you guys want to come and do a podcast? And <laughs> super quick was like, it's an interesting idea. Let's talk. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say, and then it took us two months to get back to you. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, no, and it was really great. This is a really yeah. fantastic opportunity. I really like mm-hmm. that you guys were cool with us kind of running with it. Um, yeah. Cause I realized this might not be what your average listener is kind of, I don't know what they listen to. I'm sorry. I'm wow. Wow. What I'm a, a really stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just assume no one is woke, Sahar. <laughs> no one is woke. No one is woke. Anyway, Seattle, uh-huh. so, okay, they'll wow, be expecting something like this. We do, you know, topical discussions. Yeah. Like, like I was saying before yeah. we started recording, our very first episode, true episode, was on sexism and the will of time. Yeah. And then here yeah, we are, no, like, cool. yeah, here we are, like, are you like this. to eat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like our official uh, 19th episode, not counting bonuses or midweeks. And oh, we're talking cool. about this. Yeah, you guys are definitely on a roll. Oh, that's awesome. It's, it's and, uh, you know, just want to do a little shout out to uh, hashtag Twitter time. What's up? Really? <laughs> yeah. It's a great community. Yeah. Uh, it is it. a really great community. So, Even we are role players. <laughs> love role playing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll never quite understand. <laughs> I don't know. We don't RP at Tarvalon, so. I mean. Some people do. A little, a little. <laughs> this is the this is the portion of the podcast where we get really judgy. Yeah, <laughs> we're we're never like this otherwise, <laughs> ever. That's fine, perfectly fine. <laughs> but um, for Black Tower Podcast, if you want to reach out to us, uh, we are on Twitter at Tower Podcast. Yeah, to at Tower Podcast. You can email us at <laughs> blacktowerpod at gmail.com. Uh, and our hosting site is Podbean. You can find us at blacktowerpod.podbean.com. And on the left-hand side, it has a link to our Twitter, our Facebook. Uh, Podbean will automatically generate and upload our episodes to YouTube with a static kind of image with the title. Uh, so if YouTube's easier for you than any of these millions or hundreds or whatever of free podcast apps. Um, you can do mm-hmm. that. There's also, that is really cool. yeah, uh, it's a really cool feature. Um, you can, uh, there's also a link to our Facebook page. Uh, and of course, a link to our Patreon. If you want to go above and beyond and try to support us that way. And there's some, some benefits in there for you. Uh, there may be one that isn't in the list yet that you might get surprised with, but, um, and of course with that comes the opportunity to, record our spoiler warning so our, <laughs> most of our guests get get that for free but Ooh, fancy. yeah i know yeah wow. you, you saved a whole dollar <laughs> what yeah, the, yeah yeah and you can buy yourself something nice at the dollar general dollar tree De- definitely <laughs> go get one of those like toy yeah. squirt guns that breaks in like three pumps uh, like should i get a soda <laughs> there you go so, but for those of us here at the Black Tower Podcast, of course, I have been Andrew. Aaron has been with us here in spirit, and I know he's looking forward to editing this two hours of audio. Have fun. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. You're the best. And it was an absolute honor and privilege to have James and Sahar here from tarvalon.net. Uh, again, definitely go check out the website, go join the community, be active. Tweet at them that are like, hey, I just heard you on the Black Towers podcast. You guys are awesome. That's exactly what we want to hear. Anything else we yeah, can ignore. We yeah, we're we're both very delicate and don't do well with criticism. That's a lie. I mean, I don't know James <laughs> is, but you can criticize well, me. <laughs> yes, please, there's plenty to criticize. No, but thank you so much, Andrew and Aaron and Spirit. Um yeah, this, this has been really great. Um, we really appreciate being able to talk to you guys and you're really awesome and have a great show. Oh, yeah, wow. no, it was a really great opportunity and I appreciate um, the openness in regards to talking about whatever the hell we want. And <laughs> naturally we chose this, but you probably didn't know that that was coming when you asked us, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're happy to talk about anything anywhere. Um, well, no, not anything anywhere, but no. anything. <laughs> 
anything LGBTQ as it regards to the Wheel of Time, you can probably safely approach us. <laughs> all right. Well, to all you wonderful, wonderful, beautiful listeners, definitely appreciate your time. And we here at the Black Tower Podcast will see you again next week. Bye.